Hi, I'm Vlad Vlasciano, Principal Database Specialist Solutions Architect here at AWS, and I'm going to show you how high availability works in practice with Amazon Aurora. Amazon Aurora is a relational database built for the cloud. It combines the performance and availability of traditional enterprise databases with the cost effectiveness and simplicity of open source databases. Aurora has two versions compatible with MySQL and PostgreSQL and is delivered as a managed service that automates time-consuming administration tasks such as hardware provisioning, database setup, patching, and backups. One of the key Aurora features is the distributed fault-tolerant and self-healing storage system that automatically scales up to 64 terabytes. Aurora has thousands of storage nodes in each region distributed across three availability zones. The storage is log structured, designed with database interactions in mind. These storage nodes also continuously stream data changes to Amazon S3 for backup purposes without impacting database operations. Your storage volume is distributed of many individual storage nodes. Aurora has a decoupled architecture between storage and compute. A cluster includes a storage volume and up to 16 database instances. You need at least one database instance in your cluster. That is your writer, similar to the master in a traditional relational database topology. The rest are readers, similar to read replicas in a more traditional database topology. The difference is that all of the database instances in a cluster share the same storage volume and don't have to maintain their own storage and data, eliminating duplication of work. Readers can only read from the storage volume and the writer can change data. You access the database by connecting to the cluster DNS endpoint that will always point to the writer DB instance, even when it changes. This is what you use when you need to write or you need strong read after write consistency. For read operations that tolerate eventual consistency, you can access the reader instances in a load balanced round robin way using the reader endpoint. I mentioned before that the storage volume is distributed. It is actually segmented in 10 gigabyte chunks called protection groups. Each such group contains six copies of the same data called segments, two in each of three availability zones in a given region on different storage nodes. They are illustrated here by the different colored boxes. Writes and reads use a quorum model that makes the storage layer inherently highly available, providing high data durability to your database. Aurora can tolerate failures of an entire availability zone plus an additional copy of data without losing consistency of the data. This protects both from unusual circumstances such as an availability zone disruption and the normal background noise of individual hardware failures. So the storage system ensures your data is safe. To ensure that database is highly available to your applications, you need redundancy at the compute layer too. If a writer fails, Aurora simply promotes one of the available readers as the new writer and adjusts the cluster DNS endpoint as well as the reader endpoint. Failed database instances are then automatically replaced. This failover process ensures that Aurora restores access to your database quickly with a minimum amount of downtime. While in the background, it works to replace the failed database instances and brings it back online as a reader. And because the storage is shared and log structured, crash recovery processes when the new writer gets promoted are minimized, resulting in a disruption typically measured in a few tens of seconds. 
So let's see how Aurora High Availability and Failovers work in practice. I'll be using an Aurora MySQL compatible database cluster, but the processes work similarly in the Postgres SQL compatible version as well. On screen, you will see an Aurora MySQL cluster. It is shown here in the AWS Management Console for the RDS service. It has two database instances. One is a writer, the other one is a reader. They are deployed in two different availability zones. In this case, the B and C zones of the US Ohio region. This is a typical highly available configuration. Both database instances are of the same size, DB R5 for extra large, which is a typical instance size used by our customers, neither small nor too big. This cluster has a workload running on it, ensuring a more accurate demonstration. The workload is a TPCC-like transactional benchmark. I am toggling over to the Performance Insights dashboard for the Writer DB instance, where you can see detailed metrics about the workload running on this database instance. You can see here internal engine metrics, such as query cache hit rate, or number of rows read, or active transactions but also an aggregate view of the database load and which weights are more pronounced. Back to the cluster view, let's test a failover. I'm starting with node one as my writer. And in a terminal window, I'm going to run a monitoring script. This is a simple script that connects to the cluster endpoint, which maps to node one because that's the writer. And the script simply just verifies and validates what node is the writer, as you can see in the example. And I'm going to switch back to the console and trigger a failover. Selecting node one, going to actions failover and confirming the failover. Now I'm going to switch back into my terminal window where the monitoring script is still running. And I'm going to wait until the Aurora control plane executes the failover action. Now that the script can no longer connect to the database because the failover is progressing, which is expected, and it, it is able to reconnect back. However, we see some stale DNS issues for a couple of seconds as well. So now finally the failover completes. You'll notice that node two is now the writer and I've stopped the script just so we can look at the data. And you'll notice that it took about nine seconds for the actual failover to complete when the database was not available. But then the script was able to connect again However, a few seconds later, it was getting some stale DNS issues. Now, because the cluster endpoint is a DNS endpoint, maps to an IP address and the DNS system is distributed, this is normal and can happen. So the end-to-end -end failover took about 20 seconds with this method. Now, this is pretty quick for most workloads. Let's switch back to the console and verify that the failover is reflected in the console. And here it is, node two is now the writer. So this was a simple failover, just relying on DNS. Let's see if we can do better this time. Again, node one is my writer in the cluster, and I'm going to switch to a terminal window where I'm running a monitoring script. Now this time, the monitoring script is a little bit more intelligent. It has awareness of the topology of the cluster. So that when it connects to the database, it can verify who the writer node is in the cluster and reconnect if it's connected to something that's not the writer. So I'm going to get the script running and it works the same way as the last one. We can see node one is the writer again. And I'm going to switch to the console again and trigger a failover. 
I'm going to confirm the failover action and switch back to the console. And that monitoring script is still running. And now the database uh, is unavailable. The script cannot connect to the database. And now it's able to connect again. And the failover completes. I'm going to go ahead and stop the script from running so we can see what happened this time around. As you can see, it took a lot less time for the failover end to end from the perspective of that client script. It only took about 13 seconds when the database was not available. But then when it connected for the first time, it connected actually to a reader node and detected that detected that the server role was reader, discovered who the writer is in the cluster by querying the topology of the cluster, and reconnected immediately to the correct endpoint, this time the writer endpoint. And the failover end-to-end -to -end took only 13 seconds this time around. So you can see how the failover can be improved by simple intelligence on the client side. Let's verify in the console that the writer is now node number two. And that is correctly reflected in the console as well. Let's see if we can improve the client failover experience even more. And again, node number one is the writer in my cluster. I have configured an RDS proxy in front of my database cluster. The proxy has its own connection endpoint and it sits in front of the writer instance of the cluster, effectively mitigating some of the failover downtime by holding connections open at the client side. You can see that I have configured the cluster as a target group for the proxy. So the proxy is an intermediary between the client and the database. So let's see how this works. Let's switch to the terminal screen again and start our simple failover monitoring script again. However, this time we're going to use the proxy endpoint to connect. And as expected, the script connects to node number one, which is the writer of our cluster, because the proxy effectively intermediates connections to the writer. In the console, I will initiate another failover and confirm. And going back to the terminal screen, we can see that our monitoring script continues to run as before. It will take a few seconds to execute a failover. So did you catch that? Neither did I the first time. Let's look a little bit closer by stopping the script. Around second number 33, the script was still connecting to node number one, which was the writer. But then immediately after that, it started connecting to num node number two. Now, the script did not get disconnected because the proxy held the connection open until the failover completed, which took about six seconds. And in the meantime, what the client script observed was just an increase in response latency from when it requested data from the writer and when the writer provided the data after the failover. So the failover was a lot more seamless from the application perspective using the proxy as an intermediary for the connection. And let's verify that the console reflects the new writer as well, which it does. So you can see how our services can be used to improve on failovers. Thank you for watching. We are always here to help and you can reach me for questions at the email address on the screen. Happy cloud computing from all of us here at AWS.